Good morning. This is Mrs. Standridge. Um, we're reading Elijah of Buxton. Yesterday we finished chapter four. Uh, we learned about some slavers who had come to the area and how the townspeople reacted to that. Um, today we're going to be reading chapter five, Sharing the Fish. By the time me and Old Flap got back to the barn, Mr. Seggy had already shut everything up and went home. That was good for me. I'd been counting on giving him two of the fish I'd chunked to say thank you kindly for letting me take Flapjack out, but since the preacher had took near about half of what I caught, I weren't going to have no extras for Mr. Seggy. I got Old Flap back in his stall, shut the stable door, and started walking home. Folks that had finished working and had cleaned up and already ate waved or started calling to me from their stoops. Mr. Waller yelled, Evening, Eli. Them fish looks too heavy for a boy your size to be toting. You's about to end up busting something on you that you're going to need one day. Why don't you ease your burden some, son, and set two or three of them over here? I told him, Evening, Mr. Waller, but they ain't too heavy for me. You must have forgot how strong I am. Remember how I helped you move those stones and you told me you ain't never seen no boy young as me with so much strength? He said, Deed I do, Eli, deed I do. But ain't no harm in me trying for a little Friday night fish fry now, is there? I said, No harm at all, sir. But I already told Mr. Leroy I was going to give two of them to him and I already got someone that I'm going to try to swap this big perch with. He said, you keep me in mind next time then, son. Yes, sir, I'll do that. A ways on, Miss Duncan the first and Miss Duncan the second both said, evening, Elijah, looks like you done good. Yes, ma'ams. A little farther toward home, Mrs. Brown stood up out of her rocker, waved a handkerchief at me and called, yoo-hoo, Elijah Freeman, yoo-hoo, just the boy I've been waiting on. I said, evening, Mrs. Brown. I just finished baking three cherry pies, Elijah, and Mr. Brown tells me he been having a powerful yearning for some perch. You suppose a pie be worth a perch? I said, yes, ma'am. I'd have had you two of them, but I had to do some tithing and got jack-legged. She said, one's fine. You know I don't like nothing but catfish no way. I weren't never going to catch a catfish rock fishing. Catfish must be the smartest fish there is. It's like them and carps were the only fish that added rocks and horse flies together and came up with something bad. They didn't come off the bottom of the water for nothing. I walked up on Mrs. Brown's stoop. She always wore black and some of the times weren't in such a happy mind as she was today. Her only baby, a two-year-old boy, died hard of the fever two years past. And ever since that happened, Mrs. Brown was being bothered by spells. If you were out sneaking round in the woods at night when you were supposed to be sleeping, you might get a terrible fright when you came through the forest and saw her leaning up against a tree, humming and rocking to and fro with her arms wrapped round herself. But ain't nothing more terrific than walking through the trees in the moonlight and coming up on her squatting down, brushing dirt from a spot on the ground that didn't look no different from any other spot in the woods. But there was something about that one particular spot that was calling Mrs. Brown and telling her to brush at it with her bare hand. And she'd brush it till it weren't nothing but hard earth. Other times, times like this, you wouldn't have known there was nothing plaguing her. Excepting for wearing nothing but black clothes, she was just as right in her mind as me. She told Ma she weren't going to start wearing colors again till the Lord blessed her with another child. But the midwife here in Buxton and the doctor from up in Chatham both said that weren't never going to happen. Some folks say Mrs. Brown's touched in the head, but except for scaring me in the woods at night, she treats me real kind. And everyone knows can't no one in the settlement bake the way she does. I ain't trying to be disrespectful of Ma's cooking when I say that neither. Ma can fry some tolerable good fish and make vegetables that ain't exactly horrible, but she can't bake for nothing. Pa would get pretty excited if I showed up with one of Mrs. Brown's pies, 
He never let on to Ma how happy those pies made him. But if he thought she weren't listening and couldn't see him, he'd give me some big hugs and spin me round the room and kick up his heels. Mrs. Brown held her front door open and said, Come on in and pick which one of them pies you's partial to, Elijah. I said, Thank you, ma'am, and pulled off my brogans and left them on the stoop next to all my fishing tools. The inside of her house had tracked the smell of the pies, and soon as you crossed through the door, you couldn't help but open your nose wide as it'd go, lean your head back, close your eyes, and breathe in as much of that air as you could. I stood still and took me two more deep breaths. I learned a long time ago that when you're smelling something real good, you only get two or three first place smells of it before your nose won't take no more notice. I didn't want to move or nothing so I could enjoy the smell before my nose started recalling I was toting six dead fish. After I took my fourth breath, I was smelling as much fish as I was smelling pies. So I opened my eyes and commenced breathing regular. Mrs. Brown was smiling at me. I smiled back. They sure do smell good, Mrs. Brown. I ain't meaning to be unhumble, but you know they taste better than they smells, Elijah. Come on in the kitchen and pick you one. We walked through her parlor. It was one of the settlement's rules that all our houses had to look just about the same on the outside. All of them had to have a stoop and a picket fence and a flower garden out front and had to be exactly ten paces off the road. It weren't till you went into the houses that you saw the different ways that folks set them up. Mr. and Mrs. Brown didn't have much of nothing in their parlor. Where we had a table with a cloth and a vase for flowers and some chairs, they only kept an empty blue baby crib with a tired old white sheet over one corner. Where we had a big fireplace and mantle made out of bricks from the settlement's brickyards, they still had a fireplace made out of clay and rocks. Where Pa had paid Mr. Leroy to lay some maple wood floorboards, they still had floors made from rough pine. Their home only had one floor, while Stars had two. They'd only come up from America a couple years ago and were still struggling. The Browns ate in the kitchen, so they kept their eating table in there. Ma told me that lots of folks that used to be slaves couldn't bust the habit of eating only in the room where they cooked, so heaps of people in the settlement used their parlor for things besides eating food. Mrs. Brown had the pies resting on a table near the back window. Since I only had one perch for her, I picked the smallest pie and dropped the fish off the stringer into a big basin. She said, thank you kindly, Elijah. Mr. Brown is sure enough gonna be surprised when he come home and have some perch. I took the pie. The tin was still warm. I said, thank you, Mrs. Brown. My pa's gonna be surprised too. I stepped out on Mrs. Brown's back stoop and scaled and cleaned the perch. I left the guts in the basin for her garden. I went back into her kitchen. I'll bring your tin back tomorrow, Mrs. Brown. No rush. I ain't gonna be baking no more till middle of next week, no how, so take your time. Tell your ma I ax about her. Yes, ma'am. I took my five fish, my fishing tools, and my pie and started home again. As I walked, I started calculating how I was going to divvy up these last five fish. Three of them were enough for me and ma and pa if I didn't eat too much, so Mr. Leroy was still going to get the two I'd promised him. Once I got home, I cleaned all five of the fish and Ma fried them up. After we ate, I'd go take Mr. Leroy his share. He was always doing extra work, so he was the last one to lay off working. He never ate till it was late. It was easy to find Mr. Leroy. All you had to do was pay attention to the sound his axe made. Round this time of day, when it's starting to get duskish, the sound of Mr. Leroy's axe is so regular and natural that Pa says it turns into a part of the scenery, and you wouldn't notice it unless you were trying to, or unless it stopped all of a sudden. It's like the way you don't notice the sounds toady frogs make down by the river till they shut up. Then you say to yourself, them toady frogs sure were putting up a powerful racket. How come I didn't notice it afore? After I washed up, I went out on the stoop to tell Ma and Pa I was going to take Mr. Leroy his fish. Ma's hands never quit knitting. 
She looked over her spectacles and said, Don't you stay out too long, Elijah. If working with Mr. Leroy is going to mesh, mess with you getting up early and doing your chores, you know which one of them you's going to give up, don't you? Yes, ma'am. Pa ain't like Ma. He holds up on his whittling to talk. He don't try to do whittling and nothing else together since he near about whittled his little finger off that time whilst telling me about how hard he used to work in Kentucky. That finger still don't do everything he wants it to do, but at least it's still there. Mr. Leroy got him a finger that ain't nothing but a nub. Pa said, you gonna work with him tomorrow? Yes, sir. Good boy. On Sunday, I'ma help Mrs. Holton with some of them stumps she's got left. I'ma need you and Cooter to come along. Yes, sir. Maud put a rag on the plate of fish she'd fried up for Mr. Leroy, and I took it and headed down the road. Once I'd walked a spell, I could hear him chopping in the south. He was down at Mrs. Holton's place. She's what Ma calls an unfortunate soul. Her husband got sick, then got caught, while, caught whilst they was getting free, but her and their two little girls got through. She'd come to Buxton with lots of pieces of gold sewed up in her dress and bought 50 acres of land in the south of the settlement. Everyone knowed about her and talked about her, because word was that out of the 300 families here, she was the only one that never had to borrow no money to get her land. She paid for the whole thing, cash on the barrel head. Folks are speculating all the time about how much money Mrs. Holton has. She don't flash it round or nothing, but folks say anyone that can buy 50 acres without no loan must be rich as a slave owner. If you buy land here in the settlement, there's some rules you got to go along with no matter how much gold you have. And one of them is that it ain't no one's job but your own to make sure you clear your whole 50 acres and dig a drainage ditch all along your property in the road. Mrs. Holton's girls were way too young to do serious woodcutting, and it was the time of year that folks were so busy working from sun up to sundown that no one had the time nor the fight left in them to get a chopping bee going. So she paid Mr. Leroy to clear her land and dig her drainage ditch. He was always looking to do extra work because he was saving up enough money to buy his wife and daughter and son out of America. That made him and Mrs. Holton a first prize team. Mr. Leroy was happy because since Mrs. Holton and her children came to Buxton, he didn't have to hire himself out to none of the white farmers up around Chatham. And she was happy because till her husband could escape again, she needed someone to do the heavy work around her home. Mr. Leroy near about built her house all by himself, and since he was the best carpenter in the settlement, she'd paid him to put all kinds of fancy pillars and posts and gewgaws and curly cues everywhere on the outside of her house. She'd draw him up a picture of something she remembered or thought up, and he'd make it out of wood in no time at all. All Mr. Leroy's work had folks saying that Mrs. Holton was going to win the most beautiful home in Buxton contest this year. That was something that didn't sit too good with our next door neighbor, Mrs. Highgate, because she'd won it for the past five years, one after the other, and weren't particularly pleased about someone else aiming at her prize. I got to Mrs. Holton's house and knocked on the door to pay my respects. Evening, Eli. Evening, Mrs. Holton. Follow your ears. He way out back. Thank you, Mrs. Holton. Ma said to tell you she asked about you. Tell your ma and pa I asked about them, too. Yes, ma'am. There was kind of music to him when Mr. Leroy was felling trees. From about a mile off, it sounded like one person playing, and all you could hear was a steady, regular crack sound that rolled towards you, like it was being carried on the wind. That was the axe biting into the tree. Once you got a bit closer, it started sounding like there were two folks playing music, and you could hear something that sounded like ch coming from Mr. Leroy. That was his breath getting squoozed out of him once he hit the tree. If you got close enough that you could see the sweat flying off of him, it sounded like someone else was joining in, and you could hear a sound like whoo. That weren't nothing but him sucking air back in till he got set to swing again.
if he finally got close enough that you started getting nervous that the axe or them wood chips he sent flying were going to hit you, you'd hear a sound that went k, which was the sound of the axe getting pulled back out of the tree. The harder and longer Mr. Leroy worked, the more regular and musicish the sound he made got. So when he first started, it would sound like crack, ch, hum, crack, ch, hum, crack, ch, hum, ha. But once he'd been going at it for a while, he got swinging faster and faster till he sounded like crack, ch, hum, ka, crack, ch, hum, ka, crack, ch, hum, ka. So as he went from being musicish to being machinish, which is what the preacher said Mr. Leroy was. He said he'd heard Mr. Leroy's heart beating in his chest, and that instead of sounding like it was made out of flesh and bone, it banged and pounded like it was made out of pure iron. Mr. Leroy saw me and took one more crack cha hoon and left the axe stuck in the tree where it last bit. He took a second to let his breathing catch up to him and said, Evening, Elijah. Evening, sir. That time already, is it? Yes, sir. Hadn't even noticed the sun was setting. Mr. Leroy took a rag out of one of his overall pockets and wiped the sweat off his head. This weren't nothing but a waste of time, though, because soon as the rag left his face, sweat rolled right back all over it. He rubbed his left elbow and arm and said, You had you some luck fishing? Yes, sir. Thank you kindly for remembering me, son. Mr. Leroy sat on a stump, and I sat on one next to him. <clears throat> he took a drink out of the jug of water he always keeps in the field and pulled the rag off the plate of fish Ma had fried for him. Ma had put some okra and potatoes and dandelion greens and a big piece of Mrs. Brown's cherry pie on the plate. Mr. Leroy said, you make sure you thanks your ma, Elijah. This is mighty kind of both of y'all. Walking all this way to give Mr. Leroy a plate of food was worth it, because weren't nothing scarier nor funner than watching him eat fish. He didn't believe in wasting nothing, so he chawed every single piece. Fins and bones weren't nothing to him. Why, I bet if I'd left the scales and the guts on those fish, he'd have chawed clean through those too. I asked him, Mr. Leroy, sir, ain't you never choked on one of them fish bones? He said, how you gonna choke if you's mashed them up good? I don't know, sir. I try real hard to pick all the bones out of my fish. And when one of them does get through, it seems like it don't want to do nothing but stick in my throat sideways. It's enough to make you want to quit eating fish. Mr. Leroy kept chomping and said, fish eating's like anything else in life, Elijah. If you go at it expecting something bad to happen, all you're going to do is draw that bad thing to you. You can't be timid about nothing you do. you got to go at it like you're expecting good things to come out of it. If I was to worry about bones choking me, it'd happen every time I ate fish. Ain't nothing further from my mind. Fish bones snapped in his mouth like dry twigs. Mr. Leroy finished off the vegetables and paw and pie Maud gave him and handed me back the plate. Be sure you thank your ma and pa, Elijah. Tell your ma I appreciate her thinking about me. Now come on, we got us a lot of work to do. Okay, well that was the end of chapter five. So what do you think about Elijah? What kind of, um, how would we describe him if we were talking about character traits what are some ways that we could describe Elijah? Let's think about that and see what we can come up with, and maybe we'll discuss some of those tomorrow. Um, I'll read again tomorrow about 11 o'clock, and I hope you can join me then. Bye.